I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker. Coming up. If we look at the back, here's a clear indication of the Industrial Revolution in that this is a bandsaw mark, not a pit saw mark. A woodworker's look at antiques. We're going back in time to unlock some woodworking mysteries. Then we're making our rounds with popular woodworking's Glenn Huey. He has a great technique for cutting any size circle with a router. Our toolbox features some wonderful books every woodworker should read. One of the reasons I was so attracted to woodworking, it was so challenging to me. I mean, I was a literature major. I didn't know squat. Meet one of the top teachers who wrote the book on joinery, literally. Get to know Gary Rogowski. And we're shining the light on the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, better known as SAFM. Find out why this group might be the one for you. All of this and more, this time on The Highland Woodworker. Highland Woodworking has been my choice for fine tools, information, and supplies for decades. In Atlanta, Georgia, if you know antiques, you know master furniture restorer, Alan Noel. There is so much a woodworker can learn from the work of past masters, and Alan will help us to unlock the secrets. Alan! Chuck! What brings you here? Listen, on behalf of woodworkers, I want to find out what can we learn from antiques, and you're the guy. Well, being a fellow woodworker, you can learn a lot just by looking at construction methods, the way things were put together, the longevity of the piece, and how they were finished. And I have some great examples in the back if you'd like to go take a look at those. Well, let's go find out. All right, come on. Yeah, follow me, Chuck. Hey, let's look at this piece over here. This is a great piece of furniture from about the late 1700s to the early 1800s, and it shows its use so beautifully well. Uh, it's made out of solid oak. Uh, it's got oak and oak veneers on the front here. It shows its age beautifully from all of the use and the shrinkage. Uh, there's just so much to see here. All right, well, let's, let's dig in. All right, well, first of all, let's look at how long this piece has been around. Judging from where the drawer is constructed and what it's constructed out of and how many repairs have been done to it, there's an old handle right there. The lock is missing. This is another set of handles that's been added to it somewhere along the line. And we can see here from the little small holes inside, it had pierced pulls on it at one time. So this piece has been around for a very, very, very long time and been worked on many, many times here. See, the dovetails are completely gone. Sure. So some carpenter from a long time ago just tried to make it functional. And he did a good job of making it functional. Aesthetically, it doesn't look quite as pleasing as it should, but it's, it's usable. And that's all that mattered for this old piece of furniture right here. And it's here in the shop for us to do some restoration work on it and make it useful again. Um, uh, it's something that you can see was just used and used and used and it's faded from the sun. Uh, it really hasn't had any attention paid to it for years and years and years. And that's what makes it kind of cool for us. We can see the use in the, in the piece. We can see how people lived with this piece and we can see how it was built for the most part. And um, something like this more than likely was uh, made for the masses, I would say. Uh, not a super expensive piece when it was made, but still a beautifully made piece of furniture and it shows its age and use well. You got something that's a little more high-end looking. I have an English piece over here that was built in the 1850s, probably right around the Industrial Revolution. And uh, it's also been altered because of the age and all that. You know, it's got different hardware on it and all that. So this is a good antique. Actually, this is not an antique. In, in American terms, this is an antique because it's over 100 years old. But in European terms, this is not an antique because it isn't 200 years old. Fascinating. Uh, these construction methods are, it's all bench built, hand cut dovetails, um, traditional building methods and all that. The difference in, in this piece here and that piece over there is the quality of the materials they used in pieces like this isn't quite the same quality as they used in that over there, this, the little nightstand. 
This has a half inch top, veneer top, and uh, as you can see from these elongated cracks that this is not very stable at all. And also the, the veneer is raising up, meaning there's a tremendous amount of shrinkage going on from the substrate. So that kind of gives you the indication that this is not made of the best materials and workmanship. Just looks good. Just, just looks good, and that's what they were after, something that looked good that most people could afford. Uh, and when you see pieces like this in America, uh, most of the time the knobs are gone because you can clearly see on the inside that there used to be a screw and knob right here. So they've taken this chest of drawers and made it into a Heppel white chest of drawers or something similar to that. Um, if we look at the back, here's a clear indication of the Industrial Revolution in that this is a bandsaw mark, not a pit saw mark, but a bandsaw mark. Now, how could you identify pit saw marks? Pit saw marks would be more of an angle. And these are straight across indicating, you know, a long blade. It's going right, slicing right through it. So that's what you're seeing right here. And you can see the consistency of the blade itself has, you can see where, you can see this mark right here and this mark here look pretty, pretty much the same. So the blade probably had a, some type of um, uh, flaw in it. Well, Alan, it looks like they didn't spend a lot of time on the back of the furniture. Uh, well, they didn't uh, because it's something you couldn't see. Uh, on uh, furniture that's got a lot of age to it, and the older it is, the less attention they did spend on the inside of the piece because you couldn't see the inside of the piece. And uh, aesthetically, it was what you were looking at on the outside that they paid the most attention to. That's why this back is so rough, is because this was against the wall. And you'll find that the interiors are very rough too uh, because, once again, they spent all of their time on the outside, which you could see. Well, have you got a piece that's in the process of being restored now? I have a beautiful French desk over here that we're in the process of French polishing and bringing back to life. It's right over here. Let me show you this. Well, I want to see that. All right, here we have a beautiful little lady's writing desk. As you can see, the, the painting is starting to come alive again. And uh, it has paint decoration on several different areas. It's on the sides. It's on the top and the lid, which is in a different area of the shop right now, mm -hmm. uh, the lid has a nice painted surface here. And you can see the little roses. It's got lots of decorations that you really can't see unless you look at it really hard. Also missing from the piece right now is all the ormolu that decorates the piece. That's being gilded. And what's that word again? Gilded. It's, it's being re-gilded with gold. And uh, that's a process of, well, plating here again. Plating and polishing the highlights and having a satin background. Um, that's something that we don't do here. We have to send that out to have that done. Uh, and other than that, this piece is just about finished. Um, and we're really, really, really pleased with the outcome, how much has come back to life, how much of this uh, painting is actually still intact. Now, how long does the process take for French polishing a piece like this? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to wet sand the surface and get it as smooth as possible and not eliminate any of the painting. So this is a very tedious process. It takes a lot of time to do this and a tremendous amount of patience. Um, the last thing you want to do is hurt the painting here, you know, and also you want to keep as much of the finish intact as possible. So wet sanding it is a process that just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of uh, patience to do this. And once you're finished sanding it smooth and making everything uh, as vibrant as possible as far as the painting goes, then you French polish the whole desk again with shellac. Beautiful piece. It's really a beautiful piece and I think our client's gonna love it when we're done with it. I know they will. So Alan, I guess it could pay to know your local antique restorer. I think that's a very good thing to do because we have a vast knowledge of all the different types of building methods, finishing methods, and we can usually tell you what the, when the piece was made and, and good information like that. It's a comprehensive field of woodworking, <laughs> antiques. Thank you so much, Alan. You're welcome. Thanks for coming by. Along with persistence, I think knowledge is one of the best tools in your toolbox. Let's look at some books to see what could possibly help you become a better woodworker? Jeff Miller has a new book, The Foundations of Better Woodworking. And I'm just thrilled to tell you that this has the key 
to how to stand at your bench and how to use those hand tools that we all love to use so much. It's a great addition and is for every woodworker. George R. Walker and Jim Tolton have a new book, By Hand and Eye. It tells how the artisan woodworkers of the glorious past design their pieces of furniture proportionately using ratios. You can do it too, and this should be a part of your collection. Let's not forget the classics. And in woodworking, there's no better classic than the trilogy by Tay Fred. It teaches furniture making, shaping, veneering, finishing, and joinery. And also, in this edition, comes with a DVD. There is no more basic set of volumes for your library than the Tay Fred trilogy. Coming up. Watch as Popular Woodworking's Glenn Huey takes an interesting approach to inlay patterns. Plus, master woodworker and teacher Gary Rogowski hear how a rocket scientist helped propel his interest in the craft. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Bessie, a leader in clamps since 1936. If you know clamps, you know Bessie. Bessie, simply better. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises, to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Highland Woodworkers are found all over the world. Email a picture of you and your woodworking project along with your name and where you live to picture at thehighlandwoodworker.com. Glenn Huey teaches us an easy way to cut the inside of any size circle that you would need to make in your workshop. This time on Popular Woodworking's Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. Glenn, this is a beautiful piece of work here. I love all the inlay. Thanks. Now, some people would do this with hand tools. Mm -hmm. 
But I understand you can do it with a router. Absolutely. Yeah, originally this work would have been done with hand tools, obviously. But I'm a huge fan of the router and all that you can do with it. And I'm, a, I'm especially a fan of patterns and pattern bits. I use them all the time in my shop. So we're talking about the curves and things that go on here. This part right here, obviously the rest of it's straight. Right here, we're cutting curves. So for me, you know, you could lay it out, cut it at the bandsaw, shape it in hand, do it all that. But I prefer to build a pattern. So I make a pattern that fits right here to my top edge. Then I clamp it in place and I can use the router to clean that up, again, using a pattern bit. Sure. The big issue I found came in how to step this back because I needed to come back an inch in order to put this banding on. And if you look at the way things are set, you can't just slide this pattern back to the one inch area because we then, you can obviously see, we're not gonna be an equal seven eighths of an inch or one inch as yeah, we get done. it changes the reveal all right. the way around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely does. So you have to come up with a new pattern. Then the new pattern now, you see how it lays out in line. Now all of a sudden, when I get it correct, you can see that that pattern changes. And what happens is we're not only moving back, but we're also moving that hump in. So my problem is, how do I get that done? And so I wanted to start with my original pattern. And I remember back that if you use two router bits, a pattern bit and a rabbiting bit, you can take any profile and move them any direction you want, specifically from a wider pattern to the narrower pattern. And that's what I did. Just two simple router bits. We'll take a look at them right here. These are the two router bits. This is a three quarter inch pattern bit. And if you're not familiar with pattern bits, they're really nice because the bearing on it is the same size as the cutter. So wherever you run that bearing, the router bit cuts in the process. So you don't have to figure up that difference. Right, you're not doing any offset work whatsoever. The other bit we're using is this one right here. And it's a rabbiting bit. It's set up for a half inch rabbit. You can set it up for any variation by changing the, the uh, bearing up on the top. So this is set up for half inch. So what I'm going to do is show the technique where you can use the rabbiting bit and the pattern bit to step back a half inch at a time, or two steps would give you one inch, which is exactly what I needed here. All right. I can't wait to see it. Right. Well, the easiest way to demonstrate it is not necessarily with these patterns, but one of the fun things that I used to demonstrate was working with routers and router bits in this fashion, just taking an ordinary hole that we have. For instance, in the shop, I have a number of uh, drill bits, but no four inch drill bit. So yeah. if I wanted to make something like to hang my dust pipe to get to four inches, I got to find a way to get out to that four inches that gives me that control that I need and gives me a perfect circle. A common workshop problem. Absolutely, really. sure yeah. is. So I'm going to start with a two inch hole, which we always have. I mean, a two inch a drill bit is pretty common. Yeah. And I'm going to use the rabbit bit first and cut around the top edge, creating a half inch opening and then clean that up with my pattern bit. And that's gonna take the two inch hole out to three inches. And if I just repeat that process again, it gives me out to four. Easy it's a enough. real simple process. I can even understand that. Let's see. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get to it. Now, the only question here is making sure you get in the bit or in the hole without touching. So you wanna make sure you're set up in the center. Sure. So there's the first step. Now we come in with our pattern bit, and the pattern is going to the bearing is going to run right around this side and clean up the rest of that hole for us. And so you could just keep going. Right, yeah, it's, it's just one more step to go to four inches, five inches, wherever you want to go with it. Well, Glenn, that was great. I could use that in my shop over and over, but how does that relate to making the pattern? Oh, well, the, the, the easy tie-in is the fact that we actually are starting with this wide pattern, and because we're moving back and in, the same process of using those two router bits is going to give you the different profile on the as you cut the second pattern. And that profile, then, is the one that easily lines up to give me what I need to come through here and clean this out for the edge banding. So first you use the rabbit bit, mm -hmm. and then you clean it up with the trim bit and you've offset it. Absolutely, it's perfect every time. Still ahead, it's just a stool, right? Spend a moment with Master Woodworker 
Gary Rogowski and see firsthand why his most popular piece is really his most complex. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws, like their new powerful 10, 350, 14-inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker 2, presents the PVW Blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip-outs. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. Gary Rogowski wrote the book on joinery, literally. We took a trip to his Northwest studio to see what the king of joinery is teaching and how he got there. One of the reasons I was so attracted to woodworking, it was so challenging to me. I mean, I was a literature major, I didn't know squat. Gary Rogowski's work went from squat to prominence, but it took some time. No, my childhood was not involved with tools or building stuff or, you know, I'd kill ants just like any other boy, but that's, that's about, <laughs> sorry to say. Uh, but I, I wasn't, uh, you know, some model planes and some, you know, I remember building plastic birds. And that, that, remember that, uh, the, the visible body, you know, that, uh, plastic model of the of the body and I yeah he had one and I tried uh, painting on the arteries and the veins what a disaster <laughs> although his painting skills weren't up to par his grades certainly were Gary was an excellent student and went through high school and I was uh, you know grade A student and uh, honor student and all that and uh, went to University of Illinois and uh, was honors there and got bored. And so uh, came out here to a college called Reed College and there's nothing but smart, maladjusted folks out here. They're really, really smart people. And I met physics majors and I would hang out with these physics majors. And these physics majors were great because they had this, and I'm still in touch with them, they had this concept of the world that's completely different than a literature major. A literature major is out and, you know, they're out, you know, roaming around, lost in thought. You need 30 pages on something, boom, I can, it won't say a thing, but I can get you 30 pages on it. Right? But physics majors, they're, they're like, well, you know, on the, on the uh, nuclear level, you know, protons and electrons and mesons, and they're doing this stuff, and they can talk about it astronomically as well, right? So this, these, these giant pictures. So they had a completely different way of looking at the world, whereas a literature major, I thought everything was kind of extruded at the factory. You know, telephone pole, the wires, everything came from the same factory, right? I didn't know. An astronomy friend, 
opened his eyes to a whole new world. He started to play around with uh, metalworking and said, well, I can't do that. So, you know, I might try some woodworking. My grandfather was a carpenter, my dad did some carpentry. I thought, I could try this. After four years of learning everything he could learn in a basement workshop, Gary made up his mind. I became a, a custom furniture maker. You know, I, I would build one-of-a-kind pieces. I started showing in the galleries. And galleries are, were a good way for me to get exposure, to be part of shows. I started to do uh, more public art work, so uh, a series of carvings. Uh, Flora and Fauna for the Forest Service. And then the Oregon State Archives uh, was a big project in 91. I did all the library tables for that. Big, big, li 10 library tables. So. And designed all the cabinetry and had someone else build that. In 1991, Gary was awarded the Oregon Arts Commission Fellowship in Crafts. Not long after that, his passion for woodworking and teaching came to a head and he opened up the Northwest Woodworking Studio in downtown Portland, which teaches and promotes traditional woodworking. At the studio, we have three different programs running. We have the mentoring program, we have our summer classes, and then we have our, our year-round classes, fall, winter, and spring, for locals. So those are mostly evening classes. We have 10-week classes. Uh, Zach, my assistant, teaches one uh, for novices. We'll have a hand tool class, we'll have a router class, we'll have you know, various classes throughout the year. But we're also doing uh, workshops, and I'll do a workshop, and, and we call them Masterworks classes. I moved here about a year ago from Austin, Texas to take the resident mastery program with Gary, and it's been going on for eight months. We're about a month away from finishing, and it's been great, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, I came in, just wanting to develop my skills and become a good woodworker as, as quickly as I can. Awesome. I mean, it's, uh, you get out of it what you put into it, but, and it's a lot of work, but it's great. You know, I have his book on joinery and stuff, and that's been a big help, too. Gary's literature major came in handy when he penned The Illustrated Guide to Joinery. It's an encyclopedia of woodworking joints and how to make them. But if you don't get the joint the first time, don't worry. It's by making mistakes that you learn. That's why I want people, you know, cutting dovetails right from the start. Just try it. This is not rocket science. And I have a friend who's a rocket scientist, one of my physics friends. Um, it's, it's practice. Just go and practice. You'll get better at it. Early on in his woodworking career, Gary found good use for his failure. Like the first stool I made um, it was this three-legged thing, but it, it had no uh, it had no splay, so you'd sit on it and gradually just kind of tip over. <laughs> so that became a plant stand. His next stool, however, became a huge success. What is now commonly referred to as the Rogowski stool continues to be built today with very little construction redesign since the very first one in 1978. And this is the first one I made in, in 1978. Uh, and it's still together, and it's pinned and wedged dowels, uh, red oak, <laughs> yellow by now. But uh, this first one I made, and then I started making more. It's the most complex piece I built in the shop. Is that right? It's absolutely the most complex because of the compound angles. And the first time I did a class on the road was uh, in Montreal. And I taught this class, and it was so tough. I was terrified of, of teaching this class because of the complexity of it. Is that right? Let me tell you why. So we'll demystify it. Yeah. Well, well I'll try. Okay. I'll try. All right. Bear with me, because uh, you start off, and you, and you're going to mortise this uh, stretcher, this bottom rail, into your two legs. Now, every time you drill a hole, you're doing it at two angles. So this is 90 degrees here, this hole, and 90 degrees here. This mortise comes in at an 82 degree angle. I designed this so that everything was at 82 degrees, okay? symmetry. So it goes in at 82 degrees and at 90 degrees to this face. Life is good. Sure. You're happy. You put it together, you say, this is good. And then you go ahead and cut these side rails at 82 degrees and 90 again. And you put them together and you measure them 
and you realize that you're a quarter inch different at the top of the rails than you are at the bottom of the rails and you're going, what the heck just happened? And that's the compound angles. Because they're tipped at two angles, they start to converge on one another. And I've done the math on it and we're out by one degree ten minutes. Wow. One degree ten minutes makes a difference of uh, sure. over twelve inches of about a quarter of an inch and it's just about impossible to put the piece together when they're tipped in like that. So these mortises go in at 82 degrees again, but off by a degree or so, a fat degree. So uh, it's, a, it's a revelation. We were talking about failure before. I've done this. I've failed several times. Well, that's the way you that's learn. That's how you learn. Yeah. yeah. That's how you learn. So these mortises have to go in just out a little bit, and then we adjust our tenon shoulders as well. So the tenon gets cut straight, but we angle our our tennis shoulders. So when it goes together, it's all right, but uh, it takes some it takes some work. So there's there's plenty of uh, fussing, but it's you know, it's a great. Ooh. Help me with this, would you? <laughs> <Sorry, Chris. laughs> well, if you get it together, it doesn't need glue. No, I always glue. I did a project in a class years ago, and we didn't glue it, and the piece cupped on me. So I always use glue. I see. Always use glue. Uh, when the when the seat goes on, that probably doesn't have to be glued. Uh, I use a, a, a loose dowel through here, so because I wanted a nice flat fit to the bottom of the seat rather than like a Windsor chair, and um, that's something else I realized when these dowels go in. These are just some dummies, but you, you get the idea. When these dowels go in, they're closer together at the top than they are at the bottom. That's right. So you have to stretch. You have to spring it in. You have to stretch the, yeah. the seat in order to yeah. get the, the legs to get the seat on. And uh, so we've, we now run this as a class, and everyone has glued up by day five. And it is... Well, let's just say it's a it's an interesting day on Friday. <laughs> I understand yeah, completely. Yeah, I'm yes. sure you do. <laughs> yeah. it's an interesting day on Friday because it's uh, you know oftentimes with the glue up in five minutes you can ruin a, a week of work. So, or succeed nobly and mightily, and yeah. so that's good. what we do. We succeed. Success is easy when you have a teacher like Gary Rogowski, a self-taught woodworker with a passion for being a catalyst for fine woodworking. This stuff has been around for centuries. We're just rediscovering it, you know? This, this idea for my stool, that's, it's been around for a long time. I just came up with a different take on it. So that's, and there's, that's one thing I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be doing. I'm happy to be keeping these skills alive because I think it's important to keep these skills alive and to keep this knowledge you know, kind of passed on. My circle of influence is, is very small, but I hope that those drops in the puddle spread out and affect other people by how I affect the people that come in contact with me. This time on our Woodworkers Community Spotlight, we shine the light on the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, also known as SAFM. American Period Furniture, a body of work representing a wide range of distinctive styles, traces its roots to European craft traditions that migrated across the Atlantic to be reinterpreted in the American colonies. The Society of American Period Furniture Makers, known as SAFM for short, is a national organization whose members see themselves following in the footsteps of the great craftsmen who built our finest masterpieces. Our members range in skill from the novice to the amateur master to the professional. What we all share is the same love of period furniture making. Education, access, passion, and camaraderie all play a part in opening the doors to the past. We partner with scholars, museums, and master craftsmen whose knowledge, influence, and skills are generously shared with the membership. As a member, you'll receive our quarterly newsletter filled with news from our local chapters, featured articles, tips to help you with your own work, book reviews, and much more. You'll have full access to our website, 
special access to numerous museums and exhibitions, the option of attending our annual conferences, and you will receive a copy of our critically acclaimed annual journal, American Period Furniture. So if you're inspired by these treasures from our nation's past, then join us and make your next woodworking experience an historic event. If your woodworking community would like to submit a video and share with our growing audience the highlights of your organization, just write to us at the address you see on our screen. We look forward to hearing from you. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of The Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that does it for this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.